Me. <laughs> I'm streaming on YouTube. Oh, so uh, it's not are we? It says on my screen. We're not. Um, mm -hmm. We're not. Well, like not muted. Not yet. Um, sorry, everybody. I'm, I was just making everything go live, so that's why I wasn't answering because I was just putting in passwords and all that. Mm. Sort of thing. Um, yeah, it looks like there's another couple of people waiting yeah, to come so in. As well. I'm just still admitting people as well to the meeting. Um, mm -hmm. well, um, sorry, everybody. I was just making everything go live, so that's why I wasn't answering because I was just putting in passwords. And yeah, it looks like there's another couple of people. Yeah, and I'm just sort of putting people as well to the meeting. I can't tell you. I'm just making everything as well. That's why I was answering. Yeah, it looks like I think if everybody could just bear with us a couple of minutes, it looks like there's some technical bits <laughs> going on in the background before we uh, before we start. Right. Hello, everybody. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Louise was absolutely right. We were just doing technical stuff because this is the first time um, that we've been live streaming to YouTube, um, and um, you probably heard an awful lot of sort of feedback chatter um, because what happened is that we put it onto live stream and it has a twenty-second delay, um, and then we were trying to find how to mute that. Um, <laughs> I would say talk amongst yourselves, but I think you're all mm -hmm. muted. <laughs> so mm -hmm. maybe sing yourself some hold music while you're waiting. Rachel, I don't know if you're aware, but all that's on YouTube is all the little pictures of everybody that's watching. I think that's because we're not sharing the screen yet. So uh, I think yeah, I that think one. Rachel's probably taken off the slide that was being shared. Yeah. I guess we could probably True. if we put up um, our slide, and then hopefully you should be able to see. Uh, something slightly more. Does that make a difference, Andy? 
We'll just have to wait a minute for the uh, the lag to catch up. <laughs> oh, to catch up, yeah, because yeah, we're on the. I keep forgetting we're on the delay. Yeah, it's on there. It. Excellent. Great. Right. Um, so <laughs> we think we think that we have turned off YouTube on this this one. The YouTube should be live streaming, hopefully, Andy. Um, so um, that that should be working now. Yeah, it's um, okay now. Yeah, I'd, I'd just like to explain for those who um, weren't part of this talk last time. Um, we were Zoom bombed, um, which was um, a, a pretty unsettling experience, uh, I think, um, particularly for Steve, who was giving the talk. Um, and uh, But he bravely carried on and, and got to the end of his talk. Um, but it's made us rethink our security. Um, and that's why we've um, had everybody in the waiting room um, and uh, we've admitted everybody this time. Um, and um, it's also why we're then live streaming. So one of the advantages now of being part of Buxton um, Field Club and, and paying your subs, if you like, is that you get to take part in the live Zoom, which means that as normal, you can ask questions and, and take part in the session. And for everybody else, we're welcoming them to the live stream. Um, they can then have virtual chat between themselves, um, but can't interrupt the session, as it were. Um, Dave's monitoring the chat um, on the live stream so that if there are questions raised on that live stream, um, we're very glad um, to take a note of those and ask those questions on behalf of the people who are watching by live stream. Um, but otherwise, uh, if you're taking part in the Zoom, um, then you'll be able to ask questions as normal at the end of the session. Um, so um, uh, I think that we are ready to begin, Louise and Stephen. Um, yeah. yeah. And um, so I'd, I'd like to, uh, to introduce uh, Louise and Stephen Moon, who are giving the talk tonight. Um, you may have caught their talk at the beginning of the season um, when they talked about Yellowstone and the wolves, the reintroduction of wolves into Yellowstone, which was a fascinating shorter talk. Um, but uh, if you like, we love them so much, um, we've invited them back um, to talk in more depth because um, they do a huge amount of traveling and are, are wildlife enthusiasts and great um, photographers too. Um, so um, their talk tonight on Madagascar and the endemic species there um, should be absolutely fascinating. Um, so um, without further ado, um, Louise and Steve, then you can start your sharing and I will pass over to you um, and uh, mute. Uh, put, and if everybody can make sure you're on mute, please, that would be extremely helpful. All right, good evening, everyone. And hopefully you should see on your screen a picture of um, some ring-tailed lemurs or the backsides of some ring-tailed lemurs. If anybody can't see that, then uh, wave frantically. <laughs> no, it's, we're good. Okay, so in this presentation, we're going to show our photos experiences and hopefully a bit of knowledge about some of the wildlife of Madagascar, um, which we hope will explain why we fell in love with the country. So we first visited Madagascar in 2009, and that was actually a year where there was a lot of uh, political turmoil, um, during which the mayor of the capital uh, sought to oust the incumbent president. So with all that happened, the tourism industry was, was obviously impacted. And so we opted to go for a private tour um, organised through a travel company called Wildlife Worldwide. And we were absolutely blown away by the wealth of wildlife that we saw and, and knew that we had to come back for more. So after a 10 year gap, we, um, we made it back and we really weren't disappointed by what we saw, um, except for the, the further environmental degradation. So these four photos are just a little summation of why we sort of loved Madagascar the first time round. So the picture in top left is, um, is, a, is a tiny, tiny little chameleon. And I remember seeing Sir David Attenborough with one of these, um, these dwarf chameleons, which are fully grown, even though they're very small. Um, but when we went to Madagascar, we never dreamed that we'd stand a chance of finding something that tiny and so well camouflaged. 
However, as you might expect for something this with you know tiny little legs, it doesn't have a very big territorial range. So it made it quite easy for our, our guide to, to locate one. And I got to hold it on my hand and it just didn't even feel like it weighed anything at all. Um, the picture with both of us in, looking a little bit younger, um, <laughs> is uh, us stood outside the entrance to Marajeshi. And little did we know what was in store for us when we posed for this picture at the entrance to this national park. Um, let's just say that when we returned in 2019, we found the fitness of living in a nice hilly Buxton paid dividends, but more about that later. One of the lemur species that breeds well in captivity um, and is sort of lovely, doing a lovely pose here in front of Stephen is the ubiquitous ring-tailed lemur. And this was um, a photo of uh, the ring-tailed lemurs, which are basically free roaming around the Berenti private reserve in southern Madagascar. And it's a really popular place for wildlife film crews and researchers and the eminent primatologist Alison Jolly she began studying lemurs here in their behaviour in 1963, and she was the first person to propose female dominance in, in primate society. And then this final picture on this slide is a fruit bat, and we saw those also in Brenti, and there were just masses of them in this one sort of roosting tree, and the, the, noise, the noise they made was quite amazing. So before we sort of talk about where we went, I, tell you a few sort of facts and figures about Madagascar. It's the second largest island country and the fourth largest actual island. And, and it was originally part of the ancient supercontinent, uh, Gondwana land, um, reaching, and it reached its sort of current location and size when it split off from the Indian subcontinent about 88 million years ago. Um, the separation of Madagascar from Gondwana land and its distance from mainland Africa have led to the evolution of its native flora and fauna in relative isolation. So over time, the founding stock of plants and animals evolved in response to the island's conditions and became new species, uh, which is why 90% or at least 90% of the wildlife there today is endemic. I mean, you, you could, if you, when you see some of the species in our presentation, you, you could easily be misled into thinking that some of them are related to those found in, on other continents, um, just because they, they look very similar. Um, for example, um, Malagasy tree frogs, they look very much like poison dart frogs in Central and South America, and they also have a similar behaviour, but they evolved completely independently. Um, but because of their living under the same sort of conditions, that's how they've sort of developed sort of very similar characteristics. And this is an example of convergent evolution. So the origin of Madagascar mammals is, you know, continues to be a bit of a mystery and um, sort of an unanswered question of where did they come from and how did they get there considering, you know, when the landmass broke off from other parts of the continent. So Madagascar appeared to be an island about 120 million years ago, and its animal population began arriving sort of later, probably more like 65 million years ago. So the, the long-standing theory is that animals basically hitched a ride um, to the island on rafts of vegetation. Um, and, and this theory is known as dispersal, and it might seem a bit of a far-fetched story considering the African coast is like 400 kilometres away. But um, some recent computer modeling has shown that back in, back in the day, sort of millions of years ago, the ocean currents between Africa and Madagascar were quite different and the prevailing currents could have easily carried across sort of rafts of, um, sort of vegetation um, over to Madagascar. Um, lemurs are thought to be one of the animals that reach Madagascar by dispersal. They're, they're primates, which share some characteristics with early ancestral primates, um, which more advanced sort of monkeys and apes have subsequently lost. And this is why lemurs are known as prosimians or pre-monkeys, um, and also include in this group of things like bush babies. So that even more debated is how long ago did humans arrive on Madagascar? So looking at various different papers, some research says that people may have made landfall five to 10,000 years ago, so quite a big margin. And that's based on indirect evidence of um, 
marks on bones that look like cut marks. And, but then there's also some evidence that says island settlement may have occurred one to 2000 years ago. And that's because it coincides with the extinct, extinction of various sort of megafauna at the same time. Um, and it could be that when the humans came, say 10,000 years ago, they may not have sort of hung around and it might not be sort of until much later that they began to colonize the country. So Madagascar, as I mentioned, is quite big. It's about 600 square kilometers, so two and a half times the size of Britain. And although it's got a tropical climate, the mountain chain that runs down the east side of the island, combined with the prevailing southwesterly winds, creates significant differing weather conditions from south to north and east to west. So the southwest end of the island has the driest conditions um, with very little annual rainfall because the southwesterly winds tend to drop their moisture when they hit the eastern mountain range. And then of course that means it blows very hot and dry in the west. So this combination of weather and geography means that you have a wide variety of different habitats and species, of course, that have adapted to these localized conditions. So on this um, slide, you'll just see sort of three examples of different habitats. The left-hand photo is of the Amber Mountain National Park, and that's in the north of the island, and it's an example of a, a montane rainforest. Whereas top right, um, you can see sort of quite big kind of mountainous range in that's Marajeji, which is a lush rainforest in the northeast. And then by contrast, and as has already come up in discussion, is uh, bottom right will be recognised by some people is the spiny forest or part of the spiny forest, which is in the southwest of the country. Um, although there's not so much of the spiny rainforest sort of remaining. Um, and of course, spiny by name, spiny by nature, since many of the plants there have spines or thorns. Although you might be able to see there is a lemur in the middle of the picture perched on one of the trees, and they don't seem to be bothered by the, the spines and the thorns. In fact, they merrily sort of jump around the different plants eating their leaves and fruits and flowers. So these many and diverse habitats are basically what makes the island so special. And because of this, these habitats, um, they, it means they, there's lots of different flora and fauna which isn't found anywhere else. So before I sort of start talking in depth about the place we went to, um, I just thought I'd put the map up again, um, just to give you a bit of orientation as to where we went. So when we start talking about places, you have a bit of an idea of where they are. So starting at the top um, is Dorena, which is a small town in the north. And then as you move moving further south, you can see Marajeji, um, which is located towards the northern end of the band of rainforest. And it's in this sort of rugged and mountainous massive. And then in the centre, you've got Antanarivo or Tana as it's known, which is the capital. And that's where we flew into um, from Paris. And then on the west coast is Karindi, um, and that was a new location for us when we went back in 2019. And then, um, as we sort of already mentioned in passing, in 2009, we went to the Amber Mountain National Park in the north and also Berinti in the far south. But we're not going to sort of really talk about those two locations. Um, we're just going to focus on the place we went to in 2019. So I'll hand over to Stephen now to, to tell you about the first of these places. Okay, so the first up is uh, Marajeji National Park, um, which is located, as we said, in the rainforests of northeastern Madagascar and composes about 55,000 hectares. Um, it, it's been a reserve since 1952, but it wasn't until 1998 it became a national park and open to all visitors, as opposed to just researchers. In June uh, 2007, it was designated a UNESCO World Heritage Site in recognition of its uh, unparalleled biodiversity and stunning landscapes. 90% of the, the uh, park is covered in forests, which are extremely varied. Uh, many factors influence the distribution and structure of these forests, but the most important are the wide elevational span and the rugged topography seen in those mountains. It ranges from low altitude rainforest, which is below 800 metres, through to out high altitude montane scrub between 1,400 and 1,800 metres altitude. 
with impressive diversity of flora and fauna. So there's 275 species of fern, 35 species of palm, 118 species of bird, and 149 species of amphibians and reptiles. Um, the park is also home to 11 species of lemur. So to reach the park, it was a relatively easy two hour walk through open land and paddy fields um, uh, from a nearby village which where we got dropped off. Um, now at the park entrance, in some way inside, there is a bit of evidence of uh, forest clearing um, for farming and it remains quite open and crops such as this uh, vanilla um, as well as pineapple can be spotted. Moving into the park, um, as it gets deeper, we get into the, the darker and the plant life becomes far denser. So anyone who's visited a rainforest knows it can be a challenging environment. And in, in the case of Mary Jeji, it's not so much the humidity as the hilly terrain, which makes it difficult to access, as indicated by the signpost. When we first saw the sign, we thought something had been lost in translation. How could it possibly take three hours to walk four kilometers? And that's just the, for the first camp. That's less than one mile per hour. However, we soon found out it's pretty accurate. Although the path is clear and signposted, the going gets harder the deeper you go into the forest, slippery stones and mud underfoot, with a notable, noticeable incline to negotiate in steamy or even full wet conditions. Thank goodness for our shore for deporters who not only carried our bags, but richly carried across best across some of the rivers. On our most recent trip, we stayed at the first two camps, uh, Camp Mantella, located at 425 metres of altitude, and Camp Marujegia at 775. Fortunately, this time we didn't need to walk right up to the top uh, camp, Camp Simpona, at uh, 12,025 metres. Although we were 10 years younger when we visited it in 2009, uh, it was definitely a struggle back then. Um, but despite the difficult terrain and pretty basic camps, you know, we just had uh, sort of tented camps. Um, uh, but unfortunately, some of these had, uh, had fallen into a sad state of repair because um, a couple of years ago there was a bad cyclone. Um, but it was still worth it for what we got to see, not just a wide range of wildlife, but stunning views as well. So, okay, let's start on with uh, the reptiles and amphibians we saw um, during these few days we were here. So this is the distinctively colored panther chameleon. Um, the males like this one, are the more colorful than the females and larger in size, reaching up to about 52 centimeters in length, where the females only reach about 38 centimeters. And the opposite end of the spectrum is a dwarf chameleon, one you've already seen before in the, in the intro. Um, these adults uh, only reach a few centimetres in length, but believe it or not, this isn't the smallest chameleon found in Madagascar. Until this year, Brachysium micro was believed to be the tiniest of the chameleons at less than three centimetres. But this has now been usurped by the Brachysia nana, measuring between two and three centimetres. Um, so this is a lined leaf tail gecko um, and it's often found in strands of uh, bamboo. It's linear stripes helping it to uh, blend in. The lines on this particular individual aren't as strong as they might normally appear because it's in the process of shred shredding its skin. Um, these arboreal geckos can reach about 27 centimetres long and possess spiny scales above the eyes giving them the appearance of having eyelashes. Although we saw lots of different frogs in Marajiji, um, we opted to include the picture of this one as it is an example of uh, camouflage in action. Um, not only was it camouflage, it was also hidden in this uh, dried up curled leaf. I believe it's the uh, of, of the genus Bophis, the only genus in the uh, mantillid frog family, uh, Bophino, uh, commonly known as the bright eyed or skeleton frogs. They're a good example of convergent evolution with morphologically similar species in two other families. This genus can only be found in Madagascar and the Mayotte Islands in Comoros. Um, and uh, Marujeji was a great place for anyone with a love of herpetology. So one of the highlights and the main reason we went there is seeing the uh, silky safarka. 
a large lemur with long silky white fur. Despite their relative size, about half a metre in length and between five and six kilos, they move effortlessly through the forest, unlike us humans. On one occasion, we had to scrabble up a steep and forested slope carrying heavy camera gear to try and gain enough elevation to see them. Fortunately, they stopped moving, but being a steep slope with lots of trip hazard, we did have to cling to a tree for balance whilst trying to take pictures. These lemurs actually prefer higher elevations and are seldom found below 650 metres of altitude. Like other safarka, they possess short arms and long powerful legs, which they use to propel themselves through them from tree to tree. During our 2009 visit, we met a group researching the silkies, collecting and identifying samples of everything they ate. Their diet primarily consisted of leaves and seeds, but also considerable amounts of fruits, flowers, and occasionally soil. Over a hundred different types of trees, vines, and epiphytes were, were collected and eaten. They tend to live in small groups from two to nine individuals and spend approximately 25% of the day feeding, 44% of the time resting, and the remainder devoted to social behavior, traveling, and moth sleeping. Mating occurs on a single day each year in either December or January, with infants being born six months later in June and July. Females generally give birth to a single offspring every two years, although occasionally you'll get births in consecutive years. Unfortunately, silky safarka are critically endangered and are on the IUCN red list. It's estimated there are now fewer than 250 individuals left in the world. They continue to be under threat from habitat disturbance in legal logging and hunting. Although 10 other species of lemur have been documented in Marujeji, we only saw a couple of other ones, including this eastern lesser bamboo lemur, also known as the grey bamboo lemur. All these bamboo lemurs are members of a true lemur family and are active during the day. As the name suggests, they mainly feed on bamboo. Although bamboo is considered toxic due to the high concentration of cyanide found throughout the plant, bamboo lemurs appear to have adapted to this showing no signs of cyanide poisoning. They have greater manual dexterity and superior hand-eye coordination than all the other lemurs, probably due to their preference for the small but tasty bamboo shoots. So the odd one out on this slide is the uh, ring-tailed Vonsera, formerly known as the ring-tailed mongoose. Although they're not a part of the mongoose family, they're a small indigenous carnivore, one of six different spe species found in Madagascar. Um, their varied diet includes small birds, lizards, insects, and aquatic species. Although this one had a, 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 a fancy for uh, leftovers and used our uh, camp for scavenging bits of food, anything that was dropped. Um, so there's uh, over 100 different species of birds found in the park. Um, they're difficult to spot, especially being in rainforest, and even harder to photograph. However, this is a Malagasy white eye. A fairly common bird, um, and it was spotted and heard high up in the trees above our camp. So vangas are one of the Madagascar's best known endemic bird species. They vary greatly in size and appearance, from this striking helmet vanga with its broad blue bill to the black and white sickle-billed vanga. Vangas fill a niche occupied in other parts of the world by woodpeckers, wood hoopoos, shrikes, tits, creek tea, tree tree creepers and nut hatches. The beaks of vangas are indicative of their preferred prey. The helmet vanga opting for small chameleons, frogs, insects, centipedes, and the odd scorpion, whilst the sickle-billed vanga's long curved beak is ideal for probing bark for invertebrates. As you'd expect from a rainforest, there are plenty of invertebrates. At night, torchlight reveals hundreds of tiny glittering eyes although the owners are barely visible. We did see a few different species during this day, such as this handsome golden orb weaver spider and what looks like some form of wasp that we can identify. The millipedes of Madagascar come in a variety of sizes and colors with over 40 species of giant pill millipedes, such as this one that is rolled up into a tight ball to protect itself. They belong to an ancient family that's also found in Southern India and Sri Lanka split apart by the breakup of Gondwana land. 
So where Marajeji was a test of our physical fitness, we knew that getting to our next destination was going to be an endurance test by road. But of course, when I say road, I actually mean it in the loosest sense, since most of the major paved roads were created during the French occupancy, and they seem to have sort of undergone little or no maintenance since the country gained independence in 1960. Um, the roads are the sort with potholes basically big enough to swallow a car. So traveling by road is neither speedy nor good for the back, although my Fitbit clocked up an awful lot of steps. However, when we actually went to uh, travel on this journey, um, we were pleasantly surprised because the road seemed better. And we found out that the current president's election promises included one to fix the road to Dorena. So what we were expecting to be an all-day journey actually started off quite well, um, especially when we had quite bad memories of the torturous uh, route that we took back in 2009. Although, of course, that didn't last, and um, that was too good to be true. So after about four or five hours in the car, and uh, having no time to stop for lunch, we came to an enforced stop. And our gu guide basically informed us that we had to wait for an unspecified length of time whilst they were blowing up rocks to fix the road. So the whole group of us were, you know, got out of the cars all hot and bothered and were sort of hanging around the place for about an hour and a half before we were able to get on our way again. And we stopped briefly at Dorena Town just to pick up a bit of lunch, which turned out to be some laughing cow cheese, crackers and a bit of fruit. Um, about an hour before sunset, we finally arrived at camp and we're just about to get settled in when we were told to quickly grab our walking boots, our torches and our cameras to go in search of a, a particularly elusive animal, which only comes out as the sun goes down. And this is what we're looking for. It's the eye eye, the world's largest nocturnal primate. A truly bizarre looking creature with its large sort of bat-like ears, bushy tail, and a sort of skeletal fingers, so which some almost a sort of a, a creature you might imagine to have been created sort of by the mind of Lewis Carroll or, or Roald Dahl. But for me, it, I just think it's a wonderful sort of beast, really. Um, and it's a lemur I'd really wanted to see since we watched um, Mark Cowardine and Stephen Fry on undertaking a similar quest in the programme called Last Chance to See, a programme I recommend if, if anyone's not seen. So despite being really tired by the mammoth journey to Dorena, we, we leapt into action as soon as we found out that there was a local guide who was waiting by an occupied II nest. So with barely an hour before you know, the sun went down, we knew time was short. So we basically trotted off um, with the guide. And of course, being Madagascar, this meant going down, then up, then down, then back up again. So we when we got to our sort of destination, we were out of breath, um, but we had this real powerful sense of anticipation and we arrived just in time um, to see the I.I. clamber out from its, its daytime nest. So it being my first ever sighting of an I.I. in the wild, I, I, I nearly jumped up and down with joy. <laughs> but of course, if you're watching wildlife, you can't really be noisy in the way around the place. So I kind of put my binoculars up and had a good look and then sort of got the camera out and sort of uh, started taking some photos of it moving around the treetops and you know it moves quite it moves quietly and it kind of came out and it had a good stretch and it had a good scratch I think they must have quite a few fleas and it, then it began to move along the, the branches almost like a cat moves along and um, not only did we see this individual and we spent a reasonable amount of time watching it before it moved off we we're really fortunate that the guide managed to find another eye eye in a different location. So we got to see a second wild eye eye. So you might wonder why the eye eye looks quite so strange. And, and the, the way it looks is a clue to some of its unique traits. And if you look carefully, you can just see the eye eye's middle finger. And it's, um, it's really sort of thin, or it looks a lot thinner than the rest. And what you probably can't tell is that it has a ball and socket joint. Um, and then there's those sort of massive ears and those very sort of distinctive teeth that actually continue to grow, which is a unique feature among primates. So, and also something you can't see is that this lemur has a very large brain for its body size. Its brain is about the size of a, t of a golf ball. So in combination, these physical attributes 
allow the eye to use a form of echolocation to locate and extract its uh, favourite food, which is insect larvae. So what they do is they move along a branch and as they do, they tap their middle finger on the tree branch and sort of pick up the sound with those big ears. And then using their big brain, they turn the sound and the echo into a sort of picture. So they can work out where there is an insect that's still tunneled into the wood. And when they know that, they basically use the big teeth to chew through the bark and put the finger in and sort of winkle out the grub. And recently it was discovered that IIs have another weird feature, which is they actually have a stick digit on their hand, which is a tiny pseudo thumb. And they kind of know it's a thumb because it's, it's got fingerprints on it. <laughs> so these um, lemurs are solitary, um, but they do have something in common with the silky safarka, which is they're also considered endangered. Um, but because they're quite elusive, so although we it sounds like we found them quite easily, they're not really very easy to find. So research, researchers find it really quite difficult to make any estimate on the actual population numbers. And as I said, <laughs> I really love the way the II looks and, and how it behaves, but unfortunately the Malagasy people aren't too keen and they actually consider it fardy or which is kind of like a taboo or bad luck. So if one is seen during the daytime, it is like to be killed, but fortunately, because they're nocturnal, that doesn't happen very often. So after all that excitement of going out looking for the II, the next day we had a bit more time to, you know, look around our surroundings and try and acclimatise because it was quite hot and dry there. Um, when we stayed there in 2009, we were camped inside the forest and were looked after by some people from a local village. But this time we stayed in a purpose-built camp, which was established as part of an eco-tourism initiative. And you can sort of see from the picture a bit of an eye, it gives you a bit of an idea of what the landscape looks like. It's not, it's not like the solid forest like you saw in Marajeshi. It's just sort of rolling hills covered with a patchwork of deciduous and evergreen forest. But interspersed, there's also these sort of degraded grassland and dry scrub and agricultural land. You can, you can definitely see patches of sort of that red bare earth in, in the photo. So um, what has, what's happened is that the core area around Dorena has now been sort of turned into a, a protected area. It's about 57,000 hectares in size. And that's managed by a, a non-governmental organization called Fanaby. So aside from the clearance for farming, um, another one of the main issues in the area is um, that there's gold mining and, and this sort of small picture in the bottom left hand corner is actually a hole that someone's dug to, um, to look for gold in a very basic fashion. So when we saw the second II, that part of the forest we went to was absolutely littered with holes all around the ground. You had to be very careful where you were walking, especially at night. So obviously this is, is not too good for the wildlife or people because the holes don't get filled in at all. Um, and obviously all these holes being dug is very bad for the, the forest habitat. So it makes, you know, getting around a, a real challenge. Fortunately, this uh, golden crown safarka tends to move around in the trees. So the, the damage to the ground doesn't directly cause an issue for, for it to move around the place. Um, but obviously that destruction has meant that the um, crown safarka is classified as critically endangered. Um, partly because they have one of the smallest sort of documented population sizes and ranges of any lemur. Um, they're very much confined because of the sort of discontinuous forest fragments. So aside from the slash and burn land clearance and habitat loss due to mining, there also are instances where gold miners have been known to hunt the safarka for bushmeat, even though they've been they've had a protected status for quite some time. Um, so the population again is hard to estimate, but it's estimated at about six to ten thousand individuals. So this is um, another image of a golden crown safarka, and they they live in small family groups, about six six members. And there's usually close ratio of males to females. And again, like the silkies, they feed on a wide variety of seeds, fruits, flowers, and leaves. 
And then the mating usually occurs at the end of January with a, a gestation period of six months. Um, when the young are born, they'll feed from mum for about five months and then they'll be able to forage for themselves on, on food, which happens to be quite abundant because it coincides with the wet season. So just to bring in a different kind of uh, lemur, this is a Dorena sporty lemur and they're sort of a medium size and they've got a long tail. Um, they're also nocturnal, even though this photo is obviously taken during the daytime. And that's because often you see them peeking out from tree holes during the day. Don't know why that is. But at night, they're, they're very vocal and obviously very active, bouncing around um, and feeding on leaves and flowers. So you could probably tell from the, the sort of images of the landscape, we visited Dorena during the dry season. And um, knowing what the roads are like, you can imagine when it rains, the roads become impassable. So it's a very different environment to the, the rainforest of Marajeji. And the, the flora and fauna has to really be quite drought tolerant. So this tree, um, you might be able to guess actually, it's one of the six endemic species of baobab in Madagascar. And it's, it's classified as near threatened. Um, it grows in dry deciduous forest and can reach sort of 20 meters. Um, and the, tr the trunk can be sort of your classic bottle shape, but also more cylindrical with, a, with an irregular crown. Um, this weird sort of furry ball that I've showed for scale next to my shoe um, is a baobab fruit. And you might, if you've ever been in Holland the Barrel somewhere, seen baobab fruit powder in, in, in these sort of shops. And it's often sold as a superfood because it's got a high level of vitamin C and other nutrients. Although the source of those powders is like to come from um, the baobabs in sort of mainland Africa. Now this really, this bright yellow flower, for obvious reasons really stood out because the rest of the landscape was quite monochromatic while we were there. And it belongs to a uh, pacopodium or elephant's foot. <coughs> you can sort of maybe get a gist of that from the top photo that it, if you kind of half close one eye, it maybe it looks like an elephant, elephant's foot. Um, I mean, you can see it's quite dry and there's, there's not a lot of um, sort of flowers and things. So you can imagine when it, when it rains and, you know, it's the rainy season that the forest probably really does come alive. Um, some other interesting things that we saw in Dorena. Now this picture, these sort of white protrusions, it's not fungus, um, it's not lichen, but it's actually the nymphs of a, a flatted leaf bulb. And when they become adults, they're a really pretty sort of rose red color. Um, the white waxy substance is, is a sort of um, secreted by them. And it looks like kind of wispy feathers. Um, so it makes them look a lot bigger than what they actually are. And if a predator tries to grab them, such as a bird, then the strands just come away. So the, the bug can just hop off and the bird's just left with a sort of beak full of nothing really. Um, a bit like kind of Marajeji, we didn't really see a lot of birds, but we did see this nest and this contains the eggs of the Madagascan magpie robin. And the photo I've put in next to it is a photo we took in a different location um, of the actual bird. And you can see that that is quite a green landscape. So they do occupy a, a wide range of habitats. Again, it's another endemic species. It's closely related to um, the Seychelles magpie robin and Oriental magpie robin. Um, chameleons is, is an, you know, another species that um, Madagascar is famous for, and this is the Oosterlase chameleon. And it's probably the most common species that you'll find all across Madagascar. And that's because it's got no real preferred habitat. Um, it's also very adaptable, can survive in a variety of conditions from dry forests like here through to rainforests and even sort of plantations and gardens. And finally, um, we spotted this uh, giant insect, it's about seven or eight centimetres long and it's a, it's a king cricket. Um, it took quite a bit of looking online, I must admit, to try and work out what this was. Um, it's a, you can tell it's a female because it's, you can probably just about see it's long ovipositor. And um, 
It's part of a large family of mostly flightless insects, which are uh, found across the Southern Hemisphere, including South America, South Africa, Australia, and New Zealand, where they're known as uh, wetters. And their wide distribution seems to indicate a common ancestry, which sort of dates back to before uh, Gondwana sort of fragmented. And again, their sort of wide distribution is because they can sort of thrive in lots of different habitats. Um, they can cope quite well with temperature variations and their diet is pretty varied as well. They, they can eat insects, fungi, dead animals and, and fruit. So I mentioned we were in Durango during the dry season. However, <laughs> we were almost caught out by uh, some unexpected heavy rain on our last night. And uh, fortunately for us, but not so fortunate for our fellow travellers in our group, um, who got woken up by a free cold shower in the morning as the as the sort of rain came sort of gushing through various gaps in the in the roof on straight onto their bed. Um, fortunately, we're in four wheel drive vehicles, so we managed to sort of negotiate the muddy puddles and and the deep ruts um, on the return journey. And um, but we did see a, a lot of other vehicles that were decidedly less well equipped, like this one on the left. I don't know if you can see, but um, it's got parts of the car, like the bumper and stuff, stuck onto the roof. Um, however, despite this, they got back to town about the same sort of time we did. We kept passing them each other on the on the way back, um, much to theirs and our amusement. So we headed back into the capital, and that's when we um, took a flight westwards to our our next destination, which was a place we haven't visited um, when we were there in two thousand and nine. So if we thought it was hot in Durania, then Corindy came as, a, as an unpleasant shock. The temperatures here hover close to 40 degrees during the, the stay in this simple tented camp. With no breeze, air conditioning or fan, we all struggle to live in this oven-like environment. In this climate, it is easy to understand the shortage of water. Luckily for the camp, it was brought daily from a local well by an ox cart to fill our so solar showers, where it was heated to near scalding but it was still great, greatly appreciated nonetheless. This striking twisted baobab is considered to be one of the smallest of the endemic baobab species, usually reaching only four to five metres, although they occasionally found up, up to 20 metres. The trunk is bottle shaped um, with a distinctive constriction beneath the branches and an irregular crane. Like this example in the camp, the bark is usually a reddish brown when they're mature but they're grey and wrinkled when young. So Karindi is situated on the southwest coast and uh, Karindi means dense forest with wild animals, with the claim of having the greatest density of primates in the world. But as you can see from this picture, it's been heavily deforested. Only the national park is currently protected and there is also an unprotected reserve right next to the park. Um, the area is mainly dry deciduous and tropical dry forest. During the warm dry season from March to November, much of the wildlife is hibernating. The vegetation is brown and the trees are leafless. Animals and plants only come to life during the raising season. So our guide reported that our tent had a, had a guest who could be occasionally seen drinking from the shower. One afternoon, we heard some scampering in the roof and looked up to see a pair of eyes looking at us from the decorative panels from the post holding up the roof, a grey mouse lemur. So mouse lemurs are nocturnal and they're all arboreal, usually only seen during night walks with their eyes reflecting back the torchlight. So seeing one in daylight was a real treat. The grey mouse lemur is one of the smallest primates in the world, yet this one is actually also the largest mouse lemur. The award for the smallest primate goes to the Madame Burt's mouse lemur. With a body length of only nine centimetres and a weight of 30 grams, it's small enough to fit in a teacup. It was first discovered in 1992 in Karindi, the only place it is known to live. However, the population estimate is less than 8,000. 8, um, with the deforestation of the area, it is rated critically endangered. If the deforestation continues at the current rate, it is estimated that the Madame Burt's mouse lemur will become extinct within 10 years. 
So in total, there are eight different species uh, of lemur in Karindi, and we were lucky to see six of them, only missing the two dwarf lemur species. This is Vero safarca, one of the more famous lemur species, known for the way they hop along the ground in a sideways motion, often de described as dancing. However, they're far more agile in the trees, being able to leap 10 metres between them. Although this safarca is widely distributed around the west and southwest, the conservation status has been updated recently to critically endangered in 2020. So this isn't a hedgehog, but it's a tenrec, although confusingly it's called the greater hedgehog tenrec. Despite its apparent likeness, they're not closely related to hedgehogs, but are another Malagasy endemic, splitting from the, their closest relatives, the African otter shrews, about 50 million years ago. Their reproductive capabilities are remarkable. They can produce up to 32 offspring in one litter. And to cope with this large brood, they can have up to 17 pairs of nipples, a mammalian record. Now, another odd, odd species is the Thusa, uh, which has many traits of cats, but it's closely related to the mongoose family. It's the largest carnivore in Madagascar with a body length of 70 to 80 centimetres and a weight of five to eight kilos. And it's a primary predator of lemurs. In 2003, studies showed that all of Mag Malagasy carnivores shared a common ancestry. So they're not now placed in their own family. They're found throughout the island from the Western dry deciduous forests to the Eastern rainforests, but are locally rare in all the regions. They have semi-retractable claws and reversible ankles, so it can both climb up and down trees head first. While being active during the day and night, it has peaks of activity in the early morning, late afternoon and late night. A solitary animal, they only congregate during the mating season. Copulation occurs up a tree, with the female occupying the tree for up to a week. Um, often the same tree is used, which can see up to eight males waiting below, hoping for a lucky break. So the birding is definitely easier in this area because it's more open. Um, and there are 47 different species uh, in the area. These two birds are actually both examples of the Madagascar paradise flycatcher. All the females are rufous, such as the one on the left. Um, but the males can either be rufous or black and white and possess a much longer tail than the female. They're fairly common throughout Madagascar in both woodland and forest habitat, including those heavily modified by humans. The Rufus Vanga can be found in both eastern and western dry forest and has been seen foresting, have been seen for, foraging invertebrates alongside the paradise flycatchers. The male has a black on the breast, whilst the female has a pale breast, as in this example here. They're mainly found in the mid-story and often sit motionless for long periods. The giant kua is well named at around 62 centimetres. Like all kuas, it has a featherless blue skin around the eyes and a long broad tail. Most of the time it's found on the forest floor, searching for insects and small vertebrates although it will sometimes go into the trees to roost or call. Its voice is loud, resonant and ringing, in common with other members of the cuckoo family that also has a reversible third toe. The Madagascar nightjar is common throughout the country to be found mostly, to be found in most habitats, except closed canopy, forest and treeless grassland. The Malagasy name translates as day sleeper because it roosts during the day relying on clever patination to blend in with the leaf litter. At dusk, it becomes active, swooping through the open areas to catch flying insects. Its highly distinctive call is also most often heard at dusk. So Grindy Forest has around 50 different species of reptile, including seven chameleons and 11 species of snake. Here you can see a couple of collared iguanids, um, also known as swifts. Um, obviously no relation to the birds, but um, the dark mark on the back of the head, um, you can see on the left hand one, just rain by eye, is actually called a pineal eye. Well, this eye cannot see, it's sensitive to light and contains both a lens and a retina, 
and it's thought to measure periods of sunlight to regulate daily rhythm. The presence of iguanids on the island is a bit of a mystery, um, since the majority of closely related species are found in Central and South America. One theory is that the brief existence of a land bridge connecting with South America via Antarctica allowed the iguanid ancestor to colonize Madagascar. So geckos outnumber all other lizard groups in Madagascar. This is an example of a big-headed gecko. Um, they are exclusively ground dwelling and hence they are known as ground geckos. They typically possess these beautiful patterns and the large eyes are indicative of their mostly nocturnal activity to avoid day predators like the snakes and birds. So Madagascar has no pythons, but there are three species of boa. The presence of boas on Madagascar is, is another biogeographical puzzle, since there are no boas on mainland Africa or much of Asia, the closest being found in South America and the South Pacific. So like the iguanids, their ancestors may have crossed by an ancient land bridge. Our photography guide, Nick, has a, has a soft spot for snakes, so it shouldn't have surprised us when he appeared with a pillowcase containing a Madagascar tree boa um, that he'd found around camp. As the name suggests, they're generally found in the trees during the day, but can be found on the ground at night, hunting for mammals, birds and amphibians. They're up to about two metres in length, um, and these boas are very widespread, um, with two different populations, the brown, brownish western population and the green, greenish eastern population, often treated as different subspecies. Um, an interesting little boa fact is they give birth to life young. In the hot conditions of Kurindi, this Madagascar ground boa I'm holding was actually very mobile and uh, was, was definitely pretty wriggly. Uh, although it's the larg largest of all the Malagasy boas, it two to three metres, it's much smaller than its American cousins. Aside from the size difference, it can be differentiated from the tree boa by the lack of grooves on its upper lip. Probably just as well, since this ground boa was confusingly found up a tree. Being bigger also means it can tackle larger lemurs, as well as tenrex and birds. So this is a common big-eyed snake, um, and we saw it whizzing across our path during one of our daytime walks. Although it's venomous, um, these smart diurnal snakes are dangerous only if you're a small mammal, um, or a sand iguana or other small reptile, as it kills its prey by injecting a small amount of mild venom from fangs at the back of its mouth. One of the most photographed sites in Madagascar is the Avenue of the Baobabs, particularly during sunset. There's a group of 20 to 25 Grandidier's Baobab trees that line the road, with some trees being up to a thousand years old. Grandidier's is the largest of the endemic species at 25 to 30 meters in height, and it's known as a bottle tree with its trunk fills with water. They now reside in scrubland, but originally stood in dense woodland. This woodland has been deforested, but the baobab remain, probably as a result of locals using the tree as a water source and for building materials. They fruit in November and December, and it's made into jam and fruit juice and sold at the local gift shop. In July 2015, the area was made a natural monument under conservation. However, there's no visitor fees, which result in the local residents receiving little income from the tourism. So moving on to Andesi Bay, Mantadia National Park, which um, consists of two separate parks covering about 155 square kilometres of protected area. The, the parks consist of lowland and mid-altitude mountain rainforest, but many of the largest trees have been removed. Um, these are definitely the easiest parks to get to in Madagascar because they're about 150 kilometres east of the capital, so about a three hour drive on mostly good road. Um, the two areas used to be connected, but again, more logging and deforestation for farming has made that meant that the two parks have become isolated. There are some enterprise and locals who set up businesses here, providing access to privately owned land for, for a small entrance fee. Uh, and the good thing about that is that they're, um, they're great for night walks, um, which have been discontinued in, in the national parks themselves. So when we were driving to um, uh, Andesibo and Mantadia, 
on our way, we noticed huge swathes of eucalyptus, which have been obviously introduced there um, as a fast uh, growing source of firewood because most of the local people cook on an op on open fires. And as you've already seen and heard, much of the original forest has been denuded. In fact, when we were driving there, not only did we see um, flames in the distance, but we thought there was a very strong smell and you could, it was quite acrid in the air with the smell of smoke um, because slash and burn continues to be employed, you know, for clearing areas for farming. Um, the upside of this location is, you know, being close, it's quite a popular tourist destination. So there's plenty of comfortable hotels in the area, complete with fans and air conditioning in some cases. Uh, th this came in handy when our hotel had a power cut um, and we ended up trying to find an alternative location with some electricity. And that was because uh, our group wanted to watch England play in the Rugby World Cup final, which happened to be on that day. <laughs> the hotel we ended up at, which did have power, was the same one we stayed at in 2009. Um, and I have to say, they have excellent chocolate mousse and profiteroles there, which was a bit of a consolation because England got completely crushed by South Africa. Moving back onto wildlife, <laughs> some more um, pill millipedes, these tiny sort of green ones. And you can see there's a sort of quite a few of them um, dotted around the floor. And it is known that the pill millipedes do tend to gather in significant numbers. You know, it can be much more than what we saw. But nobody really knows why they do this. Um, it's been observed that most of the swarms usually have individuals about the same sort of size and presumably about the same age, and often only sexually immature individuals. Uh, one of the theories I came across was that being doing this swarming might be mean a higher survival rate, because obviously sort of safety in numbers, and also because um, they're sort of meeting with sort of close, uh, it's the meeting of sort of siblings, which have a sort of close relationship in this swarm. A particular favourite, I think, is this um, draft neck weevil. And um, it's just the male, which is a sort of inset picture at the top, which has the extra long neck. Um, and it uses the neck to fight with other males to compete for the attention of a female. Um, but you, you can find them relatively easily because they tend to stick to one plant, and that's plants in the, um, the, uh, the cordifolia. Um, as you can just about make out in this case. Um, and they have most, spend most of their life on this particular plant. Their, their life cycle is about a year and they not only feed on the leaves, but they also uh, roll them up and use them to encase a, a single egg. And it's the female uh, who does the rolling up of the leaf and she, in which she lays about, she lays this single egg and it takes her about half an hour. Um, it's easy to see how this dead leaf mantis uses its camouflage to blend in with the similarly coloured leaves. Uh, it can Im even imitate their movement, um, which obviously is a good way of concealing it from both its prey and, and predators. By contrast, you've got this uh, bright green leaf mimic bush cricket. Um, so that obviously imitates nice um, green leaves to escape predation. I'd just say that the both of those insects are, are fairly fairly sizable. So once you've seen them, it's it's quite easy to, to pick them out. Um, unsurprisingly, the mossy leaf-tailed gecko gets its name from the fact that it has mossy-like skin tones and also these sort of camouflage patterns. Um, these geckos can come in a, a, a variety of different colours, sort of greyish brown to black or greenish brown. Um, and they all have these sort of markings that resemble tree bark or lichens. Um, in addition, they have sort of flaps of skin that run around the length of the body, the head and the limbs. And this flap of skin is, is known as a dermal flap. And what it does is it sort of flattens out the um, outline of the, of the gecko scattering shadows. So it makes it much more difficult to pick it out. Um, you know, you, you could easily walk past these and not notice them, <laughs> or I certainly could. Um, they're nocturnal insectivores, and so during the day they basically hang upside down or 
head downwards down the tree like this one. And it's thought that this, um, the reason they might point downwards is to avoid their eye reflection being picked up by predatory birds, such as the cuas and the large vangas. And they're quite widespread, so you can find them throughout eastern and central rainforests. Of the three orders of amphibian, only anurans, which is frogs and toads, are represented in Madagascar. Um, comprising over 300 named species of frogs, but there's hundreds more which are yet to be described. And um, this is probably why when I've tried to match up my photos with um, uh, pictures online and in books and things, I found it basically impossible to, <laughs> to narrow it down to a particular species. Um, almost 10% of the world's frogs are endemic to Madagascar. And um, that's much more than any other African country. And it's a particularly amazing fact, really, when you consider that the island is only about 0.5% of the land area of, of the globe. Um, there aren't any salamanders or, or newts on, in Madagascar, and there's only one toad, and actually that's an invasive species which was introduced from, from Asia. Um, night walks is a really good way of getting to see chameleons. Uh, because they tend to come out of hiding and you can see them really quite easily on often along the edge of paths and things and when you when you sort of basically shine your torch around they stand out quite well like this one so this is a parsons chameleon and this particular individual wasn't very big but in general they're one of the largest species and um, some of the way some of the males are close to 750 grams so just shy of a kilo um, and there's uh, four sort of known colour variants, um, though generally the uh, females are less colourful. They tend to only be sort of green or turquoise. Um, they also don't have the sort of two large kind of nose appendages that you see on the males. They are one of the longest lived chameleons. Um, they can live to sort of eight or nine years in the wild and as long as 20 in captivity. And this might have something to do with their strange sort of life cycle. So when the eggs are laid um, in the ground, they basically sit there for about a year and a half before they hatch out. And what happens is inside the egg, it sort of goes through these sort of diapauses. So during the cooler dry season and sort of during the sort of second rainy season. So there's a sort of bit of a kind of a break. And then when the hatchling breaks out using its egg tooth, it's only a sort of tiny couple of centimeters long, but immediately it has that instinct to go hunting and it can you know shoot out its tongue and catch various insects and things and it only takes a couple of years before the tongue is able to reach prey that's about a meter away so one of the people in our in our group had a uv torch so that was quite fun seeing what would be picked up when uh, that shone around and he spotted this scorpion on the on the base of a tree and you can see the colours look really strange. It's got, it looks bright blue, which obviously isn't that colour without UV light. And the, the glow of the, um, the scorpion is due to the hyaline in the exoskeleton. Um, and it also makes it glow on, under sort of natural moonlight as well. And looking around, it, it doesn't seem to be a agreed rationale as to why um, scorpions have this sort of fluorescent feature. I mean, some people have theorised it's, it's the, the substance gives them some protection from sunlight or that it could help them to sort of, you know, scorpions to locate one another or possibly just to, to confuse prey. So another um, species of nightjar, this one is the collared nightjar. Um, again, it has that intricate plumage like the Madagascar species, um, which obviously makes it great for blending in uh, during the daytime. Um, but it's harder to, it's generally harder to spot than the other species because um, it doesn't have any sort of vocalization, it's really quiet. And um, so often you have to have a really good local guide to be able to kind of pick them out on the sort of leaf litter. Um, sort of visually, the main difference, as indicated by the name, is that it has this sort of rufous collar and it's also got a slightly scaly back um, compared to the Madagascar nightjar. This is one at night, although I wouldn't say it looked particularly more awake. <laughs> um, by night, they're obviously 
you know, good predators flying around, sort of hawking, catching medium-sized insects on the wing. Um, and as I mentioned, they're, they're completely silent. Um, they also nest in ferns or small palms that can be a couple of meters up from the ground. A more, much more common bird that you see throughout Madagascar is this crested drongo. Um, they're also found in the Comoros Islands and uh, they're very noisy passerines and they're, they're very bold and aggressive and they can often be seen harassing much larger birds, um, even raptors and, and things like pied crows. And they have this kind of cheeky trick, <laughs> I suppose a bit, this sort of cleverness, a bit like kind of corvids here. Um, they have been known to follow other birds or even some small mammals that are out hunting. And if the hunt is successful, the drongo is able to imitate the warning cry of the particular animal that it's following. And this means that if they're lucky, the animal will kind of get panicked by this, drop their prey and run off, leaving the drongo to sort of swoop in for a nice, easy meal. Uh, back to lemurs again. So this is a common brown lemur um, and there's two separate sort of large colonies in Madagascar, one in the dry forest, the northeast, and a second in the, the lowland and montane forests of the east. Um, they're cathemeral, so that means they're active during the day and at night. And uh, this species is, is also uh, one of um, only two that are found in the wild outside of Madagascar. So they are, there are some of them living in um, the island of Mayo in the Comoros, but it's pretty likely they, they got there by being introduced by humans. So very different in appearance is the black and white rough lemur. Um, we were recently watching a, a clip of um, David Attenborough's zoo quest, and I think he described it as being a bit like a weird sort of panda. <laughs> it's got really thick fur, which is ideally suited to sort of wet conditions in the rainforest. Um, and again, unfortunately, it's critically endangered. Um, there's, there's three subspecies and each has a slightly different range but they all have this thing in common that they're very much arboreal and they spend almost all their time in the trees. They, they rarely come down to the ground, even when there's food there. I mean, they actually prefer to just hang upside down and then reach down for any food that's on the ground. Also like the, the ring-tailed lemurs of Barenti um, and in South, the, the small family groups are led by females. Um, so it's the, the females who choose where to rest and, and where to feed. Um, a large proportion of their diet is, is fruit, um, whereas some of the other species tend to, you know, prefer more leaves. And they also um, have a sort of unique title in that they're the world's largest pollinators um, due to their mutualistic relationship with the, the traveller's tree or the traveller's palm. And basically, what because of their, you know, physiology, they can actually peel open the, the tree's flowers and, and lick out the nectar. And um, the benefit, of course, to the trees that the pollen gets stuck onto the lemurs fur and on their faces. And then of course that gets, that travels with the lemurs onto any other trees that are flowering at the same time. They, um, they do live mostly in the sort of upper third of the tree canopy. So they're quite a way up, which, which certainly made them very difficult to see, especially peering up into a very bright, bright sky. So, Tracking them often relies on basically listening to them, so they're very loud. <laughs> so you can follow their follow their vocalizations, and and this particular one really did lead us on a merry dance. Um, we finally caught up with it, and then it suddenly moved off again. But then, it, um, and then suddenly stopped, and we could see it. Um, but then it changed direction and went over a river, which of course it did going through the treetops. Unfortunately for us, there wasn't any bridge nearby. Uh, <laughs> so we had to walk across a fallen tree over the river, which although it's quite large, it was a bit hairy. And so we sort of had to like, edge across that very carefully, getting to the other side. And of course, as soon as we got over there, took a couple of photos, it then ran off back across the river. So we didn't bother trying to follow it again. Um, this is the Diademed Safarka, um, which is second largest lemur, it's about six and a half kilos. 
And it's been described as one of the most colorful and attractive of all the lemurs um, with its long sort of silky coat. They form groups of about two to 10 and um, they tend to strongly defend their sort of family groups and their territories, um, which they share with common brown lemurs. Unlike the rough lemur, um, we found this pair basically just chilling out in the trees and uh, no hurry to go anywhere at all. I think they might have been just having a little siesta. So it made it nice and easy for us. And we basically just plonked ourselves down, sat there and enjoyed watching them. And, and, and Nick went one step further by sort of lying on the ground, almost copying them and, and pretty much sort of dozing off. <laughs> so this is the Goodman's mouse lemur, not named after ballroom legend Len, but in honor of the primatologist Stephen Goodman. And it's pretty similar in dimensions to Madame Burt's mouse lemur, but it's just beaten to the title of being the smallest because it's a little bit heavier. Um, like other mouse lemurs, um, they're able to go into the sort of like a stake st 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 torpor sort of on a daily basis and also sort of prolonged hibernation. And that's usually in response to sort of environmental stresses. Um, what you can't really see is they have these fat tails and it's the fat in the tail which is what helps them to, to um, endure these sort of uh, states of torpor and extended hibernation. They tend to be solitary, but sometimes you do find two or four of the same sex will kind of sleep together um, to conserve body, body heat. And then this other nocturnally active lemur is a Eastern woolly lemur. Um, uh, and it's the only woolly lemur that we, we saw. And it's obviously woolly by name, woolly by nature, hence it's quite sort of thick fur. Unfortunately, we didn't get to see the Avae clesii, apologies for the pronunciation, which is basically named after John Cleese um, of Monty Python fame in recognition for his work to save lemurs. And um, these uh, uh, woolly lemurs, they, they live monogamously and um, spend about a quarter of their time sort of looking for food and most of the rest of the time resting. And that's probably because their diet isn't too good. They, the leaves they eat aren't very nutritionally rich. Um, however, saying that, they, um, when they share the habitat with the uh, sportive lemurs, they do tend to sort of kick them out if, if there's a sort of a fight over food. Again, the odd one out in this isn't the lemur, but another species of tenrec. And it has these really sort of funky pattern spines. Uh, it's called the lowland street tenrec. It's mainly nocturnal and it sort of roots around the leaf litter to find invertebrates. And it, it, it can make a sort of little quiet sound by vibrating its spines. So the sort of eagle-eyed amongst you might realize there's, there's one sort of iconic lemur species which we haven't talked about yet. And of course that's the injury. So these sort of very cute looking <laughs> Lemurs with their tufty ears and sort of almost a bit teddy bear-like faces. They're, um, they're classified as a sole member of the genus within the Safarka family. And they're the largest living lemur. They're about just under a metre long and about 10 kilos in weight. Um, however, this, this modern day lemur would be dwarfed by the extinct giant sloth lemurs, which probably weighed, at it about, weighed in at about 200 kilos. So more like a gorilla. Um, in fact, all the extinct lemur species that have been discovered from subfossils, including a giant eye eye, uh, are all much larger than, than the injury of today. So um, there's quite a few legends around, or Malagasy legends around the injury, include sort of that it's the father of mankind. And um, one theory is around the origin of the local name, which is Babakoto, which is, could be translated as ancestor of man. And this comes from the story of a, a young boy who was traveling in the rainforest and he climbed a tree to get some honey. But then a passerby cut the vine so he couldn't get back down again. And then just when the boy's fate was seen to be sealed and he wasn't going to make it, an injury came sort of swinging through the trees and helped him to get back down to the ground. And it's, it might be this story that um, gives rise to the fact that uh, there's some belief that injury could be their ancestors. 
and also that the it's considered fardy or taboo to to do any harm to injury um although of course there are some people that you know don't believe this and again it's another critically endangered species again due to human habitat destruction and yet again the population size is, is not really very well sort of understood it could be anywhere between a thousand and ten thousand um individuals that are left and um it's unfortunately in rapid decline which isn't helped because they have quite a slow growth rate um they're also a monogamous uh, species species of lemur and uh, they'll only seek out a new mate if, if the former partner has died and th they don't reach sexual maturity surety until about sort of seven or nine or between seven and nine and the females only give birth every two years two to three years so and and they only give birth to one infant at a time so reproduction is quite slow it's also seasonal um and the sort of gestation with a gestation period of sort of about 120 to 150 days and the the mating pair will live with their offspring in a small family group for quite a while and in fact, you can find family groups with sort of multiple generations living together. Um, as is typical for all of the Safarka, those they can they can do this sort of massive leaps through the trees uh, using those great big sort of springs that are the hind legs. And again, this one can sort of jump from comfortably sort of ten meters, um, sort of horizontally. Um, when you go to visit the injury, uh, often the guy the guys will find them quite easy to start off with because they have quite a sort of a, a standard routine, daily routine, and their routine, their day generally starts with a collective urination and defecation. <laughs> so it's something important that you get told by your guide when you look up, be careful, keep your mouth shut. Mm -hmm. um, the rest of the day like most of the other lemurs is taken up with a lot of eating, um, a bit more resting and a bit of sleeping and a bit of grooming before bedtime. Their diet is also mostly leaves in particular. They like the, the, the juicy young ones um, of plants like laurel. And uh, the injury on the right, the photo on the right in this picture is, uh, is, is a little bit famous because it's the only sort of, um, sort of, I won't say domesticated, but a sort of lemur that's not frightened of people. And it will actually take leave from one guide called Joseph. And also, of course, it recognises the uh, natural history royalty of sort of David Attenborough and has taken leaves from his hand. Um, one of our first lemur experiences when we were there in 2009, um, we, you know, we arrived in Antanarivo. Um, our luggage got left behind. It was a long flight. We were completely tired and knackered. And we got we straight up onto the road to go to um, Andesi Bay, Mantadia. And when we arrived there, we heard this really beautiful but eerie sort of sound uh, across the valley. And we were told this is, a, this is the call of the injury and it can travel like a mile. And it's used to for different family groups to kind of commu communicate to each other their whereabouts as well as sort of warning them to keep out of their sort of you know particular territory and uh, the song is is really quite spectacular if you've never heard it because all members of a group will sort of join in like a choir and sometimes you get the males and the females will synchronize their calls but their voices are of varying pitch so hopefully this should work we'll see enjoyed that <laughs> <laughs> okay so uh, we're just wrapping up here um so basically uh, there's a number of different problems in madagascar both for wildlife and for man um there's been a there's a number of valuable timbers that grow in madagascar resulting from selective deforestation of woods such as ebony and uh, palisander used for production of high-end furniture in the past Gibson's guitars have come under some scrutiny for their use of uh, Malagasy rosewood, 
that may have been sourced illegally. During the transition period after the turmoil in 2009, damage to the national parks and conservation areas from illegal logging and hunting went unchecked. Places like Marinjeji were significantly damaged during the removal war. Uh, were damaged during the removal of valuable hardwoods. It was estimated that 45,000 rosewood trees, some species of which were themselves endangered, were cut down and exported to China. Corruption is also another issue. For example, all the exports of the Malagasy rosewood have been prohibited since early 2010, but some of Malagasy's uh, loggers and exporters also hold seats in Parliament, so enforcing the ban is, is a different matter. Um, lemurs, reptiles and birds are all legally collected for the exotic pet um, and medicine trades. The population of the place share tortoise has dramatically declined and it's estimated that only 50 tortoises remain in the wild. The, what the Durham Wildlife Conservation Trust operates a captive breeding programme but had to stop reintroduction as they were continue being poached as well. You've already seen um, the gold mines in Durena, but illegal sapphire mining is, is one of the new things that uh, popped up and that's having a huge impact. It's been estimated that around $150 million worth of gems are smuggled out of the country every year and the associated habitat destruction threatens species like the injury. The Rentu Reserve, where we saw the ringtail lemurs in 2009, is a famous private reserve but most people are unaware that this reserve of only 500 acres is surrounded by 15,000 acres of sisal plantation, where it all used to be spiny forest. Sisal production has rocketed in recent years due to the demand for biodegradable packaging. Poverty and a lack of education is also another big issue. This results in large areas being stripped for firewood because people just need to be able to survive. Eucalyptus is sometimes grown in these areas, both for building materials and for firewood, but this creates a non-native monoculture habitat and reduces biodiversity. It's also prone to se severe regular natural disasters, such as cyclones, floods and droughts, the effect of which are often exacerbated by badly depleted land, which lacks stability. Ironically, COVID-19 has not taken hold, and it's been reported they've had less than 300 deaths, However, the additional economic pressure caused by the pandemic, combined with surging forest fires and severe drought last year, have put additional pressure upon the country's resources. It's not all bad news. There are some small glimmers of light. Uh, so vanilla is an important crop, um, especially in the Northeast. Over 80% of the world's vanilla is grown here. Um, it's a, it's a non-native crop, um, so there are no pollinators. But that means to say they will have to be hand pollinated, providing a living for the local farmers. Um, however, recent bad weather has caused crop failure, pushing the price up tenfold. And that means to say, with a big price escalation, there's more room for theft and corruption. Madagascar produces some great chocolate, which is sold at a premium price overseas. Um, and uh, our group basically emptied the shop uh, of chocolate on the way back to the airport. Um, there are a number of reforestation projects being run, including trying to reforest the area between Embassy Bay and Mantadia. Uh, and the government also aims to plant 60 million trees to celebrate the 60th anniversary of independence. Solar cookers are being actively promoted and sold as well um, to reduce the amount of wood that's being used by, by 50%, so a significant amount. Um, education is also another key area, explaining the important role of local plants and wildlife to which most children and adults have very little understanding of. Whilst tourism and ecotourism can help, it's difficult to make sure that the money is reached the locals and invested wisely. For example, the park fees were excessively cheap um, and all the money's raised seemed to end up in the government's pocket. For example, the, the park fee, uh, sorry, uh, an increase in park fees is likely to go unnoticed by tourists but it could go a long way towards improving the parks and uh, the lives of the local people. We can't help but feel that the local unique wildlife of Madagascar could complete the top destinations in the rest of Africa if it were better promoted and some improvements were made to the infrastructure. 
ecotourism has the potential power to bring much needed investment to this very poor country. Okay, so that's the end. And now it's time for a river called Three Horses Beer, um, a local Malagasy staple, as this uh, volunteer has uh, put his beady eyes on. Um, so thank you all very much for listening and uh, I'd like to open the floor up for questions. Yeah, thank you, both of you. That was fantastic. Um, who has a question? Pat? Um, can you tell me exactly how all this wildlife conservation is funded? Or should, you talked about national parks. Do they get any money from the government for these? Or, or does it all depend on tourism, the money from tourists? I think a lot of it is is come from from abroad and um, investments from um, other countries rather than being directly from from the Malagasy uh, government. Yeah, there's a lot of foreign NGOs that have um, going concerns there. I mean, the the researchers we mentioned uh, mentioned in Marajeshi were from uh, Duke University, and they've got a big interest in in lemurs and. Uh, their, some of their research have been going there for over a decade and they also have been strongly involved in things like highlighting illegal logging and in fact when we were there in, um, most recently there were a group of local Malagasy students that were in the forest being educated around a recording and techniques for um, sort of measuring and uh, uh, recording the wildlife species there and again I think a lot of that is sort of at least co-funded by um, overseas organisations like we mentioned mm. about the the Darrell organisation has quite a lot to do in in Madagascar also I think the World Wildlife Fund as well has growing concerns in various parts of the country so there's definitely quite a bit of interest from overseas organisations say with with the corruption and the need for the money to go into uh, tackling poverty and economic issues there's probably not a lot of funding left for things that maybe aren't seen as essential <laughs> yeah. yeah thank you other questions just like to say uh, how enjoyable that was very informative and some uh, excellent photography there Thanks, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I'd, I'd, I'd agree with that. And um, the, the amount of detail that, that you've, you've got on the um, all the different species is really mm. quite mind-boggling. Um, and I think I personally don't have any questions because I'm just trying to absorb <laughs> all the information that you've given us and all the photographs, which were wonderful. So, um, any other questions from... Yes, Peter? Thanks, yeah, just echoing the, the okay. wonderful, wonderful talk and, and photos. It, the, 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 the various lemur species that you showed that were just so wonderful, I mean, do they interact with each other at all? Or are they, are they all sort of distinct, separate groups within their own sort of little ecosystem? Or, or, or is there any sort of interspecies uh, uh, contact or... or uh, you definitely get you definitely get ones occupying the same areas the same habitats and some of them will be like day feeders and others will be night feeders so they don't have that sort of direct competition but like you do get some like the common browns which are you know fairly widely distributed which will have some competition with uh, some of the other lemurs but i think probably it's almost like the opposite and um, what what makes it so complicated is because pretty much all the research that's done uh, and there's so many things that are unknown, especially with um, the advances in genetic testing, is they actually tend to find more new species. I mean, new species are being discovered almost like every year. And quite often what happens is it's not something that is a really, really new thing. It's just that they've gone, okay, this was previously um, one species and now we split it into two or, you know, it's got subspecies. So it's almost kind of going the other way where the wildlife gets fragmented. You get what was one species, then gets kind of genetically reclassified. So you've got, you know, ones that are very slightly different, like the um, like the black and white rough lemurs. Um, 
I read conflicting information. Some said they all look the same, and others said they've got slightly different black and white markings. So <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> who do you believe? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think if you, if anybody who publishes stuff, there, it's almost like you can, you know, publish anything, and it's potentially like new information. Like the when did humans arrive in Madagascar? So if if anybody wants to do like research projects, you could probably easily write tons and tons of papers and and, and probably discover a few new species that you could you know maybe name after yourself um over yeah. the- I mean yeah the other thing is obviously a lot of the habitats are very different and in fact a lot of the habitats are unconnected. Um, they they basically reside in small pockets. You know that that's why the numbers are so small of any individual species and, and so why they're they're you know, cut off well, it's why, why why deforestation can make a massive difference because you know one species would, will only live in this one particular forest or woodland area i mean it's particularly sad because one of our guides um he when we we saw him in we saw him again in 2019 or he wasn't our guide this time he was our guide previously and he he said my grandchildren probably won't see the things I've seen because it'll have gone in you know in, in like a generation or two. And and people like the guys are really passionate and they recognize what's happening, but because the country is so very poor, you know, I forget where it is in the in the sort of UN table, but it's third poorest. It's like really yeah. high up there. It, it it's it's very hard to be you know too critical and say you should be doing this and should be protecting it, especially coming from where we are, where we're not even looking after our own, you know, species that are in severe decline, how we can, and we've deforested the UK obviously massively, how, you know, and that's a difficult thing, I think, because the money comes from overseas, but obviously how do you get that confidence from people in Madagascar to say, accept the money and possibly accept the way that is being proposed to try and make things better? But but like Stephen said, there are little stories of good things. Um, I literally read an article yesterday, I think, that in where they're planting vanilla, again, sometimes they cut down the forest, but somebody's found out that there's a, there's a bug that attacks the vanilla and there's a gecko that eats that bug. So it's sort of a natural predator. And if you have shady areas, i.e. forest, that encourages the gecko to live there. And if you've got the gecko there, it then protects your vanilla from the buck. So there's a possible program to encourage um, replanting a forest alongside the vanilla. So it might be a sort of a sort of sneaky way of <laughs> doing some reforesting projects without, you know, for a good reason, which has a benefit to the um, to the local people um, rather than just because some foreigners said it's a good idea. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Any final question for Louise and Stephen? Steve, Steve looks like he's waving. Can you unmute mm-hmm. yourself, Steve? You need to unmute yourself. Yeah, for, for the for people who want to go there, is um, did you or your travelling companions have any tummy problems with the, with the local food? Uh, we haven't. We haven't no. had any. No, we didn't have any problems. I mean, the food is... Um, it's quite sort of basic and simple. There's not like masses to choose from, particularly if you're out in the in the camps and stuff. I think two of our tra- uh, travellers had some issues, but they kind of ate something that personally I wouldn't have chosen because <laughs> I, 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 I'm a bit more kind of cautious when I'm less sure about things. And, and probably for that reason, we, we didn't have any issues on no. both of those occasions it's just the normal thing of travel of like yeah. you know just have stuff that has been properly cooked and things like that and and you'll be you should be fine unfortunately of course things like you, you know you have to have bottled water unless you've got a um transportable you know uh water cleansing system sort of thing yeah okay nobody else seems to have their hand up i don't think um so um could I, on behalf of everybody, um, say a really big thank you to both of you because I, and I'm sure everybody else, just found that absolutely fascinating. Um, wonderful detail, mm. wonderful photographs. Mm. Thank you ever so much indeed. Um, if you can unmute and give a round of applause, that would be perhaps a nice way of ending the evening. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um,
And um, our next talk is uh, in two weeks' time, I think it is, the, the 6th of March, um, and it's Mark Cocker talking about uh, the oldest lake in Europe, Lake Prespa, and the birds and the wildlife there. So um, we look forward to seeing all of you again. Um, have a very good rest of your weekend. And Louise and Stephen, thank you so much. Uh, you've deserved a glass of wine, I think. Um, <laughs> <laughs> in fact, probably everybody has. So uh, yeah. have, have a good yeah. rest of the weekend and hopefully we'll see you in a couple of weeks' time. So thank you and good night. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.